Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric. I am here today with Michael, and we have one goddamn hell of a show today. That's right. What are we doing today? 300 and Rambo. That's Rambo 4. Yes. 300 and Rambo 4, which is called Rambo. Who names these goddamn movies? Uh, So today we finally get to talk about one of my favorite filmmakers, and also Zack Snyder and Frank Miller. You know, I'm not trying to discredit Zack Snyder and Frank Miller. Also awesome. We've talked about Zack Snyder and Frank Miller both before on the show, but the man I really want to get to, and goddammit, we'll get there, is Sylvester Stallone. So the whole concept of this show, I mean, it's, you know, it's badass as an art form, right? Mm -hmm. But also, I think we're trying to legitimize Rambo. Yeah, so Rambo got a lot of shit. I mean, it's the fourth movie in a trilogy. Yeah. We've kind of lambasted fourth films in trilogies. Yeah, The quadrilogy bullshit. Thank you, Alien. Yeah. And Rambo is the fourth film. It's definitely the black sheep of the trilogy. Yeah, right. I'm going to keep calling it the fourth film in a trilogy because I don't feel like it's part. That's what it is. No, you're right. You're right. I don't feel like it's part of the original three. It takes the character from the original three and puts it in the hands of the fucking man who's been writing the character since the 70s. We're not going to cover all the Rambo films. We're just going to cover the fourth one, and we're going to tell you why that's okay. Um, I, we've both seen them all. Yeah. Um, you know, I like the first one, but the second two, whatever, we don't even need to talk about it. Right. Uh, none of that matters. You can put all of that aside. Having never seen, I'm going to say having never seen even a Sylvester Stallone movie, anything he has ever touched, having never seen any of the Rambo stuff, you can still watch Rambo four. And you know what? If you like 300, you're probably going to like Rambo four. So we are trying to uh, present this great Rambo film to people who otherwise would not give a shit about it. Because you know who doesn't care about the fourth Rambo? Everyone. Is people who watch the first three Rambo. If you're a huge fan of the first three Rambos, the fourth one is not really... It's so separate and awesome and wonderful. And we'll get to that. But first, we are going to cover 300. Uh, We're going to spoil both of these films. We're not going to spoil Rambo. There's just... I guess we'll spoil it. But it's not not possible. Uh, 300, we're going to spoil, but the ending of 300, I wish someone would have told me before I watched it anyways. So I think you're totally safe to listen to the show, having never seen the movies before. However, if you just want to skip right into Rambo, because I've built it up so much that I'm going to need to start 300 with an apology, uh, you can use the chapters to do that. Just click the little chapter thing, zip right over there, or zip to the end of the show, and we'll tell you what we're watching next time. But the films next time are going to seem sleepy compared to 300 and Rambo, so you should just do those right now. All right, as much as I've just defended Rambo, I don't think people get 300 either. Yeah, not enough people are behind 300. Not a film that we need to defend to our audience, but still a film that we need to defend. Well, maybe we do need to defend it to our audience. All right, that's fair. I think that there's two camps here. I think that there are people who went and saw 300. These are the people that are not our audience. Yeah. And said... There's not enough history here. This is inaccurate. I don't like this film. And then there's our audience, at least some members of our audience, who may have gone to see 300 and went, this is too mainstream. It doesn't understand itself. And there's way too much history. (laughs) I cannot believe this is all right. So I'm going to try and contain my rant here because this pisses me off to no end. But I can't believe that people actually claimed they walked out of this movie and claimed that it was factually inaccurate. That was the thing. I mean, I remember this being on the news. It's got fucking, I mean, talk about a slow news week or whatever, yeah. but it got coverage on the news as 300's creating controversy because it may be historically, and this isn't the history channel. It's not. This is a comic book. Yeah. See, that's the thing is 300 is not a fucking war movie. Yeah. Okay. It's not saving private Ryan. Right. It's not fucking letters from Iwo Jima. <laughs> it's based on Frank Miller's graphic novel, 300 about the last stand of 300 Spartan soldiers against 30,000 Persian troops with bombs and monsters yeah, and swords monsters. for hands. I mean, okay, so Leonidas starts with, a, before they even get into the war, they start with this conference with the mystics who consult the oracle. Wait, Eric, are you telling me that I'm supposed to believe that the Spartans of ancient Greece went and consulted mystics on a mountain no no you're not supposed to believe that at all that's exactly my point this is setting up what kind of movie it is 
Uh, I'm not, we don't know anything about, so these are both movies that are kind of based on, I don't want to even say based on actual events, because that's the thing that's wrong, right? But uh, they're inspired by. Sure. Um, this is inspired by an actual event, and a lot of the stuff we'll be talking about with Rambo is inspired by some of that Burma stuff. We don't know anything about that, and maybe that's why we just don't care about it. And maybe that's why we like the films. Yeah, yeah. So maybe it's our own ignorance that's to blame for our love of these films. But even if they consulted oracles, you know there's mysticism and crazy. Just looking at a single frame of the movie tells you comic book movie. But I mean, you mentioned it. They're not fighting the Persians. They're fighting the Persians and Persian monsters. I mean, they get to a point, you could defend that for a while, that maybe the Persians used unorthodox techniques and created... Uh, there's for a guy cultivating with, and harvesting the best warriors. There is a guy with saw blades. For, he's a monster out of Doom 3. And you're expecting me to believe that the Persians actually... There's a fucking scene where a minotaur plays a flute. A fucking minotaur. Head of a, a goddamn goat. Body of a man is That's playing not a, a minotaur. Right? I don't know what a minotaur is. But you know what I'm saying, right? There are monsters in the film. Yeah. Are you going to go back and, and tell me that Cloverfield is a tragedy of a film because it's there wasn't actually... historically inaccurate. Yeah, there wasn't... That's not how the monster attack in New York... I mean, fuck. Come on, people. Just such a blindly ignorant thing... You come out of a movie like 300 and all you have to say is it's historically inaccurate. Doesn't that go to show oh. that the film is great, though? Yeah, maybe if, it does. If there's an audience that walks out of 300 and the best they've got is, that's a little historically inaccurate. <laughs> right. Maybe the right. film's fantastic and yeah. there's a bunch of dumb people that just went and saw it. Yeah, well, the problem is that it was really popular. Had this been one of the smaller uh, you know, comic book movies, no one would have said anything because only the core audience would have seen it. But it was the R-rated behemoth that came out at the time, so everybody fucking went to it. And that's why it, uh, it gained the controversy that it did. That says more about its success than its content. One of the things that should really let you know immediately, besides the visuals and stuff, I mean, you are, uh, you're talking about a legend. That's why the movie's called 300. It's not about 300 Spartans or 300 warriors in one particular location. It's just about 300 guys who fight. And those warriors could be the Australian army that was so tough and had so much honor behind it. I mean, you could tell the story about any 300 warriors. It just so happens that a fable already exists for this. But this is a campfire retelling of those events, and it starts with a fucking campfire narration. I mean, how much more could you have missed the point? So what we should get at is the style of this film. Okay, well, I like a lot of the style. I'm really in love with it, except the fucking wolf. Okay, so maybe we should talk about that first, actually. Uh, you know, the wolf I view as a, you probably look at the wolf and say what? I say Watchmen. Yeah, Watchmen. It's this boring, obnoxious, CG-looking monster, and I'm not into it. So Zack Snyder did Watchmen, of course. Zack Snyder also did, you're, that's going to be blasphemy on our show, by the way. I'm sure we're already getting angry emails. As soon as you say you don't like Watchmen, people get angry. I didn't like the movie. Yeah, all right, that's fine. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying I'm going to forward those emails directly to you, sir. Delete my email at doublefeatureshow.com is exactly where you can send those. Zack Snyder also did Dawn of the Dead. So we're not going to talk about his style a lot. You can go back to Dawn of the Dead and we talk about, um, you know, eventually using some of that slow motion, fast motion, whatever. All that stuff is great. But I look at the wolf as more of a Frank Millerism, which is someone we talked about when we did The Spirit. So again, go back and listen to The Spirit. We talk ad nauseum about Frank Miller, and I am the goddamn Batman and comic book dialogue. But that's kind of a, a lot of the stuff in this film. You have to, uh, you either embrace it or roll your eyes at it, but it's the, it's the I am the goddamn Batman. It's these things that Frank Miller does that makes his work stand out so far away from everybody else's stuff because of how ludicrous and how much gravity it thinks it carries. Uh, whether it has that gravity or not is really, you know, well, 300 seems to have that. Gravity. Yeah. Yeah. I think Maybe that's in part due to the acting. Maybe yeah. that's in part due to the direction. But I mean, you have to credit the writing, right? Sure. The film is made to look like the comic book. There is no small part of Frank Miller in this yeah. film. It's yeah. it's almost equal part Zack Snyder, Frank Miller and Gerard Butler. If you're so if you're willing <laughs> right. to admit that Gerard that Butler far. actually carries the film, if you're not, fuck you, you're wrong. Mm, yeah. But if you're willing to admit that Gerard Butler is actually doing a damn good job, and you this have film, to believe he's the commander. If he's not the commander, there's nothing going for you in this. 
Except the monsters from Doom that I already mentioned that are historically well, inaccurate. And it can't be easy to deliver a line like, tonight we dine in hell, <laughs> and not get laughed at yeah. by an entire audience of people. Well, I mean, a lot of the audience did laugh at a lot of these lines. I, that's, I keep going back to Frank Miller stuff, but this is Sparta. I mean, these lines that you would hear people shouting off of the L after the movie came out, that is... Uh, Frank Miller doing uh, his best job to write something so crazy no human being could say it with a straight face, and Gerard Butler giving the seemingly impossible task of saying something that crazy with a completely straight face. You know, I think the movie's about visuals, but the movie wants you to think it's about these 300 uh, soldiers. If you were to look at this against something else Frank Miller has done, I mean, I see a lot of Frank Miller, but you think this is different than some of his other stuff. Yeah. Uh, how would you compare this against something like, uh, let's say, like Sin City? Okay, so Sin City, Sin City is probably the ultimate Frank Miller thing. Yeah, right. I mean, it was the— what, It the, is, whether people acknowledge that or not. Sure. So Sin City is, is this thing where it's a bunch of miscreant, outcast people right. trying to shove themselves into the square hole with a round peg because yeah. they don't fit in. They're all kind of outcast. They're broken. Some yeah, of I guess outcast is the word. Some of them mean. are fucking deformed, yeah. literally deformed. <laughs> yeah. And 300 is the story of champions. It's the story of these guys who, you know, the deformed kids, the the Sin City characters got thrown off Pride Rock right. in the beginning yeah. and thrown down into the, the baby skeleton pool. In 300, it's the perfect examples of mankind. These are The reason 300 soldiers can survive isn't because they're a ragtag team of guys that <laughs> right. fill in where the other guys can't. Yeah. It's because This isn't Rafifi? It's, exactly. It's because 300 people perfect human stallions yeah. are standing in formation taking out wave upon wave of imperfect persian people if you're going to look at this as a writer this is almost the antithesis of sin city right it's the exact opposite of that collection of people you know in 300 the very character who would be i guess the yellow bastard in sin right. city he is the foil of the movie yeah he's what makes things fall apart because he's not the perfect soldier exactly like everyone else is i hate this guy i yeah. despise but in the way the film wants me to yeah, not right. in the way that i think he's a bad actor in or a you jerk silly. kind of way. exactly right. he ruins he, he they had a good <laughs> yeah. thing going right yeah they had a good thing going they stand in line and then, ah, who stab, a bunch of guys die. Yeah, they're just going to stay in the hot gates, which is uh, really just that part from the big fat kill. And they basically, you, this, the film calls it out. Mm -hmm. Even Leonidas starts to think maybe they'll win. And you start thinking, you know what? They're going to pull this off. There sure. may be a ton of guys, but as long as they're safe in these hot gates, they might win. The you reality, even see the narrator in the beginning, so you go, well, he survived, right. so clearly something must be going on here. But the reality of the situation is they're losing one guy, two guys, three yeah. guys. You know, Every time there's a wave, you see people die. It's very, very small amounts of guys. You, you almost don't realize that they're being whittled away. Mm -hmm. The reality of the situation is there are far too many Persians and... The 300 will eventually die and lose and fail. Not even the perfect army could beat them. So essentially what I like about this weird foil hunchback guy is he comes in and makes it not their fault. <laughs> right. They lose by some other extraneous yeah. force and they could have won. They would sure, have won. Right. But this guy fucks it up for them. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, he's not really the foil. He's the thing that allows them to uh, keep their dignity. They die winners. He's the, yeah. He's the excuse. If it were not for the betrayal... If it was just left up to a fair fight, then the 300 men would have won. But they would have died. All 300. Every last fucking one of them. I, you know, I like a lot of the colors. I like that it's very digital, but still grainy. They use, uh, you see it right from the beginning, the amber scenes are right against the kind of cold blue scenes. Um, I think the one sheet for this movie pretty much says it all. There's a lot of one sheets, but the one specifically where they're falling off, the, uh, the soldiers are falling off the cliff. They show the actual scene in, I mean, if I were to show you a picture of the, and this is why I love 300 so much. If I showed you this one sheet and I pointed to it in our studio and I said, all right, there's all those men falling off that cliff. No way would you think that that is a scene from the movie that literally looks just like it. Though it I mean, it looks drawn. It looks hand drawn. It looks animated, uh, but within the reality of the film. It's not animated in a way that, let's say, a James Cameron movie would right. suddenly have animated sections. It's done in a way that you totally buy. And I was really blown away the first time I saw this to think, wow, the effects have really gotten to that point. That kind of uh, vision and that direction 
to say, let's do this whole thing basically against green screen and still make a movie that that's not only believable, but better than it would have been if you went and did it. I mean, this would be a very boring film if you had just acted it out on location at different different places. Something I thought could never be done better than Sin City, and I would still probably say that. But, uh, man, does it come close. Yeah, even the flying dog looks good. You really want to get to that trailer, don't you? Well, I want to talk about the trailer of uh, 300 a little bit. But we should talk about the Black 20 trailer. I guess all we have to tell people is to go look for this. Um, There was a trailer done by Black 20. It's sort of a parody of 300, but not in the usual stupid parody way that everyone did after the movie came out. It's a PG trailer of 300, so it basically edited in using uh, using even more amazing visual effects. I did some editing to cleverly make the movie look... Family-friendly. Yeah, maybe cleverly isn't the right word. To butcher the movie so that it was... It's really funny. Look up the PG trailer to uh, 300. There's a lot of these moments you don't even get in the trailer, like the, the tree of bodies left behind right. by the immortals. Um, the, you know, one of my favorite from the whole movie is the mundane slaughter of everyone left behind yeah. after the battle. You know, Leonidas is eating the apple and they're talking. The narrator's about, kind of talking about how Leonidas is a merciful king and he's not a mean guy. He's a good guy. I mean, look, he's just eating an apple. Yeah. Right. As they're going through killing off all of the dead, just this sense of dark comedy that the movie has. The actual trailer for 300 is what really roped me in because it uses just like you imagined from Nine Inch Nails. Right. It's uh, it's a song that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense against the movie, but somehow, probably because the song is just so fucking good, it works. There's actually, um, when we talked about True Romance, I mentioned that there is a fan edit of the film out there that restored it as closely to Tarantino's original idea as possible. There is a fan edit of 300 that rescores the entire film with, I believe it's The Fragile, with Nine Inch Nails music at the very least. Uh, I haven't seen, but I'm really anxious to see that. So how do you feel about the actual score that's in the movie? Well, there's, I mean, there's just as much fucking loud guitar as there would be with Nine Inch Nails. Yeah, that's the thing I wanted to talk to you about is uh, I'm still iffy. I mean, I guess I love it when I go back, even if just because it's obnoxious. But it seems a little weird to me that we're dealing with something. um, I'm just going to sound like one of those historian people now. We're dealing with something set so long ago before distorted electric guitar existed to hear electric guitar over it is really, really surreal. But if we're going with the theme of artistic badassery, which right. we kind of touched on in the very beginning of the show, which is what we're kind of trying to do here with... We don't care about themes. We come up with themes right before we record these shows. Thank you for discounting all of my hard work there. It's really interesting to go, well, they didn't have guitars then, but if they did, <laughs> they would be screaming right about yeah, now. Yeah, it would be just like this. But the guitars are subtle enough not to uh, diminish the sounds of the blood spatter of uh, just that man. Every time sound is such a huge component of this movie, hearing the the sounds of the war, the sounds of the battle to make you feel like this is one of those things they demo surround sound systems with because it's just so realistic. But at the same time, it's really over the top. Um, a lot of the scene, I mean, I mentioned that the blood makes sounds, you know, blood right. does not actually make sounds as it spews out of a person's body, but just to keep things in that comic book mood, to keep that stuff, that heightened sense of ridiculousness that you need for a movie like this. I want to get to one more thing before we hit on the ending, because it's just been too long since we did this on double feature. Can we talk about feminism for a second? Yeah, I guess that's, that's your platform. That's a really weird component to throw in here. And one of those things that I think, here's what happened with this movie. Uh, with the comic to to start, Frank Miller found this story about these 300 soldiers, this legend, and he said, that's badass. I'm going to make that into a ridiculous comic book because that's what I do. So he included all of these little things that actually historically happened or were part of the original legend. Uh, but I mean, he made a comic book out of it. He made a ridiculous, awesome comic book out of it. And I think feminism is one of those things that really carried over, but it's something I definitely like a lot about the film. Uh, you see it right from the beginning. I mean, that's some of the stuff. This movie is set up, set up, set up for the first couple minutes, and they just throw a ton of it at you, directly at you, and then they just fight the rest of the time. And some of the setup you get right in the beginning is just Leonidas looking at his wife for that uh, that nod of approval. The Sparta and, nod. Yeah, before he carries out, almost like she's the one really pulling the strings. It's basically saying, look, she rules this kingdom as much as he does. 
Leonidas will even tell Xerxes later on, you know, he makes that comment about how they might as well send their women up here. I think that's supposed to be just as much a jab at him as saying our women are fucking yeah. warriors, but only the women of Sparta can give birth to the Spartans themselves. She also plays into a lot of the political stuff that happens in this. There's a strange political part to this film that, by contrast, seems boring because you're cutting away from vicious slaughter yeah. to uh, Grecian Senate. You probably need that, though, don't you? Otherwise, the brutality just wears you down. Yeah, and you go, you know what, this isn't, this isn't very brutal anymore. I've been seeing this. So Leonidas is... <laughs> and what better to cut to than a Senate hearing? <laughs> right. So Leon- Leonidas's wife, the Queen of Sparta, is essentially being roped into doing all this stuff for the man who's who's lining up to be the new king of Sparta. And he's also, you know, in with the Persians right. and he's eating all their gold. <laughs> yeah. Eventually, there's this... I don't know how to explain it other than it's consensual rape. It's a scene where she comes to this realization that it's supposed to show how much she loves the king. Right. That she's willing to do anything. Yeah. But she gives up pretty easily, doesn't she? Yeah. It's more well, of that Frank Miller kind of holding up women in one hand and then smacking them with the other hand. Exactly. In the end, she she wins. She gets this fantastic moment where she's been betrayed and the whole Senate is calling her a whore and even Grant Mazzy is there calling yeah, her the ridiculous. slut of Sparta. Yeah. And then she stabs the guy in the stomach and his stomach rips open, spilling out all the Persian gold that he's been eating. And then they realize that he's a traitor and a very hungry man and he ends up dying and they realize that the queen has been right all along and she fucking wins and she sends them to war against the Persians. But it's too late at this point. So that scene is obviously just right out of comic book type material. Uh, you don't seem to have a problem with a lot of the comic book lines in this, but I know that ending gets you every oh time. Oh my God, it's rough. There's this really egregious moment of the film after the hot gates have been have been given away. Right. And all of the Spartan soldiers are in the shield bubble. They're in a cage of shields and spears. But Leonidas is out front with his helmet and his shield and his spear. And yeah, they look heavy, too. He is angry. And Xerxes gives him one last chance to surrender. So he takes off his helmet and drops it on the ground. And he drops his shield. And you go, oh, I guess, I guess he's going to surrender. And then he picks up his fucking spear and chucks it at Xerxes. And in slow motion, the spear soars toward Xerxes. <laughs> While the spear is soaring toward Xerxes, this disgusting voiceover arises and explains to you his helmet blurred his vision and he needed to see far. His shield was heavy and his target was far away. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty spot on there. You've been working on that one? I just dislike it so much. <laughs> yeah, it, it stays in your head, I guess. Uh, all right, so there's two things here. Uh, I'm going to say, first of all, that the narrator wasn't there to see any of this yeah. stuff. So I guess, uh, you know, he's a good warrior and a bad poet. That's what's going on Spinning here. Spinning his own he's, story and doing yeah, a shitty job. He's creating the ending here. So if you're to be mad at anyone, it's not the creators of the film, but rather the narrator who the bailed narrator. early. Yeah, to b- bailed early and couldn't come up with a very good ending. But I actually have a mechanical reason I like this. Because you're right, it sucks intellectually. It's a really stupid moment. However, you need it to make this ending work. So you have this position where clearly they're not going to beat everybody else. So uh, the only triumph that he's going to get is making the God King bleed. Something that he references, you know, the movie talks about earlier. Now, if he just walks up to him, if he just runs at him with his sword and shield and pokes him and then everyone stabs him to death, that's not much of an ending. So the movie almost needs to be... Uh, deceptive in order to keep that brutality because they're not getting a victory. The movie's lying to you. The movie's saying, look at this triumphant thing that happened. He threw that spear and it fucking caught Paolo's jewelry and ripped it out of his face. And that's how you know that they won. They accomplished what they came there to do. That's the feeling you have. But they didn't accomplish what they came there to do and they didn't win at all. They gave him a boo-boo and he has to put a fucking bandaid on. That's what happens at the end of this film. So had he not dropped his sword and shield and you go, oh, no, he's going to surrender by bringing everything down to that level. You say, well, now the options are surrender or at least piss the guy off a little bit. Whereas before it just looked like he was ready to go and he's going to 
give it his last hurrah and then he's going to die. You know what I mean? By dropping the shield and sword, you go, well, I guess it's all over. Oh, wait, at least he can make him bleed. Hey, we win. I guess, yeah. I just wish everybody would hug in the shade. What you end up getting the feeling of, how you remember the movie, is that he fucking beheaded Xerxes at the end of the movie. His head just flew right off, but that's not what happened at all. He He punched the guy's head off. Got stabbed by arrows. Um, Also, the end credits, I should just mention briefly, are awesome. And that's all I have to say about that. Previously on Rambo, John Rambo, a Vietnam veteran and Green Beret, returns to the United States at the close of the war. He is met with hostility and eventually violence. They draw first blood. Rambo single-handedly fights off a National Guard platoon. He emigrates back east where he defends a group of refugees from Russian forces. Finally, John Rambo is collected again for a mission in Afghanistan, defending the innocent. After this event, he disappears into the jungles of Burma in search of peace. I guess this is the part where I'm supposed to do my Stallone, right? God, you don't want to hear that. So, you know, this is a great moment for me right now, because up until you did that, I have been so uncomfortable doing movies in a series without doing all of them. That's why we started Killapalooza. We are fucking completionists. Mm -hmm. We, if we're going to talk about something, we're going to talk about all of it. Unless we can just ignore it after Look the back first at one, the prophecy and Terminator, yeah, where we right. went through all three, just because, just there because, were three there. Right. that's that's all you have to say. And looking back, we could have probably just done one of each of those and been fine. We might have just stopped at the first one. That's we should have just done that first episode and scrapped it. Um, as you will see coming up with Tremors, uh, we're just not going to talk about the other stuff. We'll hit on it and we'll see why it's important or whatever, how it's relevant. But we just want to tackle the good stuff unless we're really doing no kidding fucking Killapalooza. And that's not what we're doing with Rambo because that's not what we want to talk about. Now, I felt bad. This is the first time we've ever really done this where we said, all right, Rambo 4, we'll just do that. Uh, However, I just want to hear more previously ons now. And that brings me so much joy that I feel like we can just jump into any franchise anywhere we want. But let's tackle the other Rambo stuff right away. Um... Everybody's brought up to speed now, but why aren't we doing the other Rambos? Well, they're they're all interesting. They're all fun 70s, 80s action films. Some of them have really good points, but the reality of the situation is I don't think there's a lot to talk about there. You yeah. don't think there's too much to talk no, about there. No, there isn't. We're both in on the first the first film. I battled you for a while to say this first Rambo, there's a lot to talk about. Yeah. But as I go back and think about it, I mean, there's the stuff in Vietnam. And outside of that, it, great movie. Don't yeah. get me wrong. But I don't know that there's a good 20 minutes. And the last thing we ever want to do on this show is drag out a movie longer than it deserves. If a movie doesn't warrant 20 minutes of conversation, we're just not going to do it on the show. It's important that you realize that we're not knocking the Rambo trilogy. Right. We're all for it. Everybody should go watch it. It's a really interesting time, and especially for film people. Yeah. If you're a film person and a completionist, you need to see them. Sure. But the one to talk about is the fourth one. Yeah. And a lot of people just straight up aren't going to go watch them just because we say go watch them. What will get them to go watch the other Rambos, if they see a Rambo like number four, that is just so full of amazing action that they could then go back and at least appreciate the others, even if they're not providing the same thing the fourth one is. We're basically pulling an exploitation thing (laughs) over your eyes and making you think the other three are this good. And it's totally okay to do because they fucking decided to name it Rambo. So if you're going to do something stupid like that, all the other movies have subtitles and numerals. First Blood Part 2, Rambo 5. Right? I mean, if you call the first one First Blood, yeah, just call it Rambo and we'll know where to start there. So let's just pretend that... We saw Rambo 4 on accident first because it was called Rambo. Now, I would say this is the best of the, as you'll call the Rambo trilogy, uh, even if only just because Rambo doesn't have a mullet in this one. And that does it for me. As uh, you learned with me and Bruce Willis and hair, that just the hair of the action star is the most important part for me. But I mean, it's Sylvester fucking Stallone. Now, for some people, they'll understand what that means. Yeah. But other people will not get Sylvester Stallone. Other people think Rocky Rambo, what the fuck? He's a big he's a big right. dumb ox. Okay, and, let's dispel the yes. big dumb ox theory. What part of that is, and that's how I felt before I'd watched any of this stuff, and now I'm loving all of it, uh, in preparation of The Expendables. It's, you know, right. we want to get people excited about The Expendables. We think that's going to be awesome. <laughs> Maybe we'll be totally fucking wrong, but probably not. So I wanted to go back and look at his stuff, and I was dreading it because of the ox thing. Because I look at the guy and I go, here's a muscly guy. He fucking mumbles like a motherfucker. I can't understand anything he's saying. I have to watch all his films with subtitles on. 
you know, all his words are slurred together and then he punches people. What's going on here? But I think he's a legitimately great one actor. Uh, that's what the first Rambo proved to me. I mean, that moment toward the mm-hmm. end of that. Uh, but also, and even more so, an incredible writer and director. That won me over immediately. He writes and directs a lot of his films. So he directed Rambo. Yeah, which the is, one we're talking about today. Which is the first and only of the Rambo films that he's directed. Right. But he also directed Rocky, starting with the second one. Yeah, all the other films in the franchise, but the fifth one. And he also did some other films, and we mentioned he's doing The Expendables as well. Something that I know a lot of people who listen to this show will love, he makes short films. He makes short action films. 90 minutes, right? Almost all of his films are uh, extremely short They are right to the point. There is no time wasted on things like, oh, I don't know, atmosphere, because that's not what you would want in a movie like, uh, let's say, the Rambo movies, for instance. I actually think there's a lot of atmosphere in the Rocky movies. The thing that I didn't get about the Rocky stuff is that I would actually really love that character and that story. I dismissed Rocky the same way I dismissed Sylvester Stallone. I said, oh, fucking meathead boxer. I don't box. I don't care. Yeah, right. He sounds like he's been boxed around too much and he's kind of an idiot. When there's something actually really endearing about, somehow we'll figure out how to do Rocky stuff later. So I don't want to talk about it too much. But not only does he direct a lot of this stuff, he writes it too. He often writes with someone else, but just seeing right from the first uh, Rocky movie, he's writing stuff. He wrote the fourth Rambo movie. He wrote a lot of the stuff in the Rambo movies. So you know that what you're getting on screen is the vision of the guy who's starring in it is the vision. It's this one-man thing that we talk about with Rodriguez or Tarantino or Rob Zombie or any of the guys we constantly hit on who are doing everything in their movie. This is even a step further because he's fucking acting in all of them. You know this character is exactly what he imagined, and if there's jokes at the character's expense, you also know that he's writing them, which is so much cooler to me than people who fucking come in as writers, not stars, not action stars, but writers who come in and write jokes about meat-headed action stars and then knowing the the stars have to recite these lines, you know, in the movie, stuff like the uh, the Italian stallion thing. Um, right. I don't. Should should we talk about that here? Or I think we should save it for Rocky. Okay. There's something really cool about that, and if you know what, if you do your Sly Stallone homework, you'll know all about that, and it'll be awesome. I promise you. So we enter at a point that you set up brilliantly, uh, where Rambo is cynical after the previous three films. He doesn't believe that people can change. And he's, uh, he runs into this crew of essentially missionaries, which is another reason that I was dreading the fourth film. The fourth film is about Rambo helping spread the word of God among us. I mean, we should, you know, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, you would think that we would go, uh, that's not a movie we can get behind. But it's played off as this... Um, difference between their mindsets as characters their their philosophies right the sure. missionaries think you can still change people you can still do good without guns right and then rambo has the exact opposing opinion where he says you know what are you going to do we're going to change your minds you got any guns no you're not changing anything the great thing about that is where when you meet this character he's cold and cynical you think maybe he doesn't think you can change people's minds that a line about guns, at first that seems to feed into the cynicism, but when you look at his character, that's actually pretty optimistic. Yeah. What he's really saying is not, you need some guns. He's saying, you know what, you can change people. I just think I have to come along and bring my machine he's gun. He's saying change is dangerous, yes. not change is impossible. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So when you see him come along with these characters, and the other thing I like is that we have the douchebag lead character uh, who no one likes and is just one of those actors that's the poor guy gets typecast as character you hate and so he shows up and rambo doesn't even want to talk to him he wants nothing to do with him he only wants to talk to uh the beautiful julia ben's character right and that's it that's all he's having so everything he does in the movie is fueled by their relationship her trying to convince him that he can change i've been talking about this about four times as long as the movie actually yeah, does movie's already they, over they set that up so you have your motivation and the rest of the time is killing. Brutal, cold killing. All right, so we, we need to step back from the hyperbole once again on the show. I'm going to say something crazy, and then you convince people that I'm dead serious okay. and not just exaggerating. All right. I think that this may be, if not of the ones that I've seen, certainly the ones we've done on the show, one of the goriest movies in existence. Yeah, absolutely, and without question. We've, we've done, you know, this is gorier 
than watching all 10 Jason films. Yeah. The kill the body count, count is higher. Yeah. yeah. We've discussed that this film has a ridiculously large body count. It's over it's, 250. It's 230, I think. 230. It's, okay. uh, it could be over 250. I remember seeing a number greatly over 200 sighted somewhere. And none of these bodies go peacefully. No, no, they don't. You know, when we talk about gore, maybe it's not some of the most cringeworthy scenes. I don't think there's a lot of cringing in here. It's mostly uh, action explosions, although there's a few, especially the first one they set up where uh, they're throwing the bombs in the water or in the grass or whatever and just killing these people almost for sport. Um, and you see the explosion just has these red chunks of meat in it thick meaty human remains oh god it's awful you know so this film is violent this film is unapologetically violent however for some reason sly stallone felt the need to apologize people were out to get this film for its violence the way people were out to get 300 for its history yeah fuck you (laughs) you went to see a rambo movie yeah right you're gonna see some raw meat well they didn't know that they would modernize the movie to such a point where I mean, that's what Sylvester Stallone wanted to do. He wanted it to have brutality, partially because of this Burma conflict. You know, that was his apology. It's not really an apology. He said, fuck you. But he said, fuck you. What we were trying to do is make people really feel the Burma situation. Bring attention to it's, that. It's, it's for realism. And yeah. it's, it's, it's basically done so that you really feel the level of violence yeah. that's going on. If your film is violent, you don't owe anyone anything. No, you don't. We talk about that stuff all the time. We talk about the splat pack kind of stuff. Violence is an art form just as much, not in real life, oh no. my God, <laughs> but in film, yeah. violence is an art form the same as, as using, it's a special effect. Yeah. You know, it, The way you treat violence is just as much part of your film as what instrument you use for your score. Sure. It's mood, it's setting, it's even pacing sometimes, it's tone, and uh, overall, it's plot points. I mean, probably most heavily, it's plot points. But I don't think it's plot points in Rambo. I think that's actually the the least redeeming part of violence. I, in much the way you do, I applaud violence in film with uh, without any reason, without any hesitation to just say, here we're going to destroy human lives just to show you that that feels terrible and maybe to fuel our characters. We don't need to destroy human lives because these are the bad people or because, and you know, that's kind of what we're doing here. But it's not even about that. It's about this is their mission, and we want to show you how brutal things are over there. We want to show you how awful things are it's over there. Something happens, violence ensues. That's that's the plot. Yeah, and that's all you need for a movie like this. I feel like there is Stallone's out of an intellectually pleasing reason to have the violence. He is justified in the excuse he makes. But we call it an excuse because we don't feel like it needs to be there. That's why we paired it with 300. Because it can be mindless. If you enjoy that type of over-the-top gore, it's not comic booky like 300. Right. It's very, very realistic. Probably too realistic. Although, no, it's not too realistic. It's the perfect amount. That's what you're getting out of this movie, and we're not going to apologize for that, and no. neither should he. But when I say it is, because I know there are a lot of people who listen to this show that are gore fanatics. They will watch any of the old... I always think about Cannibal Holocaust for some reason yeah. when I think about extremely sure. gory films. I don't know why. I don't think there's an especially large amount of gore. It's because but it, the, it's real. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, there's That's a lot the of gore realistic, is the, the gore sure. of can't no it's real <laughs> well some of it's real we don't Maybe. need to get into a cannibal holocaust i want to say i want to say it's real because i want more people to go watch the it. animal gore is real sure. i'll agree with you on that uh the human gore there's an interesting thing actually about the legality of that but we don't need to talk about cannibal holocaust yet but when i say rambo is the goriest film of all time which is probably not true but the goriest film we've ever done on the on the show it's not that it's bucket for bucket. It's not even that it has the um, the total surplus of gore is greater than these other movies. But it's a ninety minute film that is this gory. They kill over two hundred and let's say, let's just lowball two hundred and thirty people. There are over two hundred and thirty deaths in less than ninety minutes. Show me another film that has that concentration of bodies. Just that alone. Not to mention the fact that you feel each and every one yep. of these 230 deaths. You feel uh, the first time they attack the village, the children being discarded, through the fucking infants thrown in the fire. 
uh, arrows going through these people, uh, bullets going through these people, body parts exploding. You know, right in that same scene, you see a, a man's leg explode and just bl- right. blown clean off right. at the kneecap. And it is brutal. And then later on, when Rambo is on the fucking Jeep turret, yes. he cuts people in half uh, yeah. with that gun. Yeah, it's like an invisible axe. It's ridiculous. Going back to what you were saying about um, violence being an instrument, or even an art form itself, there's attention here to gore that's very often overlooked. The attention part, I mean. Mm -hmm. You know, people talk about the amount or the placement, but the sort of special effect quality itself, I think that really deserves attention. You know, blood and guts in film, that's part of the fantasy of a narrative. You see it all the time in movies, but so rarely in your day-to-day life. And so in that way, it's, it's just another prop or a piece of set dressing. Yeah. In all the time that people spend being upset, offended, or maybe even enthusiastic about it, I feel like it's rare that anyone stops to think about what we're actually looking at. You know, human beings made this film. They crafted this score, and it's some of the best looking I've ever seen. They labored over each meaty explosion to make sure the audience has a reaction, a a bigger one than, you know, any other movie where a guy gets his arm blown off. Each and every one of these effects, a crew created from, right. from nothing. They planned, tested, and built it beyond perfection. And so when I think about these things, I think of them like a, a well-done performance that you know someone has practiced over and over. Or a, uh, or a really good trick, a well-told joke. Things we've talked about in uh, talking about magic or, right. or something like the aristocrats. When I see a movie like this, it's not just the gore I'm celebrating then, but the actual craftsmanship. It's the fact that, that other living people were smart and skilled enough to visualize it and then to bring to reality these effects that, I mean, when they're pulled off, make people have that well-deserved but uh, so instantaneous reaction. It's very momentary. It's something the audience doesn't really spend time thinking about by design. Right. You know, they're just supposed to react. And when it's well done, that's all they do. But in reflecting on that, we can kind of, you know, take a look at what this really is for a second. I mean, no one actually died making this film, although um, Stallone does say they were shot at. But I mean, the gore, the blood, that's just paint and canvas. It's an instrument like you were talking about before, and it would be a fucking shame if you couldn't applaud that when it was this well done. I remember another one of these brutal scenes uh, when he's first driving across on the boat, and they're all supposed to be deadly quiet, and that other boat comes up, right? Uh, and essentially the guy is threatening to rape and kill them, right? That's what's sure. going to happen right. here. Fun stuff. Um, yeah. And so there's a, this is another one of the few plot points in the movie that you kind of have to come to terms with where he shoots the guy, he shoots him in the head and his head blows up, what, three times or something? Three or four times. I think it's actually twice that it happens. Three or four times. It explodes. In my head, it happens three or four times. It's one of those movies, we were watching it with other people. Everybody shouts, oh, right at that moment, because it is almost unexpected at that point. You, that's the first real brutal kill. You don't know what's going to happen beyond that. But that's when the point is brought up about the killing to get back to the message that the film is trying to convey. All of the characters sort of stand around and say, especially the douchebag lead from the missionaries who were just meant to hate and think is wrong, stands around saying, wow, that wasn't cool. You just killed a man. I always think, and maybe this is just because I'm watching a movie and not actually on the boat with them. I think, wow, that guy was going to rape and probably kill you. Isn't that just, at what point do you pacifist michael kester say okay well you can kill in that situation i mean if if the other character is most likely going to kill you and you're off on this you know this in this war-ridden country i mean don't you think your tour guy your security guy can fire first all right well i'm gonna be completely honest and say that i don't know if i could ever kill somebody and no, that's probably not. the wrong decision that's, that's I why i said probably, security guy i would probably end up dying in self-defense right like i would not be able to defend myself sure, out sure. of fear of killing another human being right that being said if if john rambo my security dude didn't stop this guy i would be very angry yeah it's really crazy to me to think at that moment he says hey why'd you kill that you know what I mean, like, sure. I wouldn't say that's his job, but that's what you would, that's what I would expect sure. out of him. I wouldn't be mad. I would be reservedly grateful. So what the film does here is polarizes these characters even more. Now the missionaries are pushed away 
and, you know, Julius uh, character is pushed away further from the head of the missionary team. It's the beginning of what you see. Okay, here they have clearly set up a, a test run of their humanistic philosophies. Rambo thinks people can change. You need weapons. Here is an instance where clearly you needed weapons even to get to the part where you change. Right. Because you're not even there yet. He thinks that killing is justified there. And these missionaries think literally no killing must be justified ever, anywhere, ever. And that solidifies both of their points so that towards the end of the movie, when their lives really are on the line, they have guns pointed at them, Rambo can swing in on a jeep and mow through all these people with this giant turret. And you know the characters have kind of come around on this. They finally said, all right, we weren't okay with it on the boat because we didn't see things the way Rambo did. We don't have the experience that Rambo did. And now that we've been out here in the jungle with all of these warring factions, we're starting to understand his perspective. Right. And for them, that means that killing is is justified in that uh, circumstance. I don't think the the movie's clearly not saying killing is justified, but it's saying they have finally come around to Rambo's point of view. Mm. He was right the whole time. Right. There's only so much I can say about the piles of bright red gore against the dull earth tones of the film. But there is uh, one other scene beyond the amazing mounted turret scene and the amazing... Rambo with the arrow scene and all of these just scene after scene after scene. I think that's the best thing we can say about the film is that nonstop great scenes, great action. But that's kind of something you have to see. Aside from being a gore fest and an example, one of the best gore fests I've ever seen. This also has one of the greatest explosions of all time. Have you ever seen a small scale explosion like this? No. I mean, we're talking about a nuclear device. Right. Um, I've only ever seen it on the scale where you couldn't, you know maybe still see people in the frame. I think sure. it's a little bit bigger than that, but there is a point where they detonate a, uh, a bomb that uh, it's been a dud, you know, it was kind WW2 of dropped bomb. there. Yeah. It's been sitting around. It's not a nuke, but it generates when they finally set it off. It generates this small mushroom cloud and a concussion that just, yeah, it resonates across the entire fort. It's amazing. It is uh, one of the moments every time I see this movie that I wait for. It is fantastic. That's as much of a case as I think we can make for Rambo. If people aren't going to see it now, people will never see the fourth Rambo movie. It just won't happen. Your loss. So uh, we have an email address for all of that hate mail. It's doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. And we have a wonderful website created by me. I'm awesome. Doublefeatureshow.com. Uh, I believe we also have movies that are coming up next time. Yeah, on the show. next time we're going to do Tremors and The Fog. John Carpenter's The Fog, not the shitty 2K whatever remake. All right, so this is going to give people some ample breathing room. This will accomplish a couple things. For people who didn't care about 300 and Rambo, here is the polar opposite of what's going on there. And uh, for people who got too much Rambo and have been watching it every single day in their spare time since they heard this show. Take a break. Yeah, I guess take a breather and watch more Rambo. I just rolled right over you there, didn't I? Yeah, it's all right. No, it's cool. I'll just say it right here. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm totally prepared. You got anything else you want to trample me with? Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Watch more fucking film. Bye.